Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Shainer, and I was selected by the Holocaust Center as the 2021-2022 Holocaust Educator of the Year. I'm not claiming that I deserve that title, just that I have it right now. I've taught for 33 years and concentrated on Holocaust education for the last seven. But I've taught Anne, the, Anne Franks, the Diary of a Young Girl for more than half of my career. Honestly, though, I never really gave the diary or the young girl as much attention as either deserved. Anne's diary is almost ubiquitous in American education, as it should be. For most students, it serves as an introduction to Holocaust studies. It is a safe entry into a perilous field, the thoughts of a child roughly the same age as my students, filled not only with the fear of war, but also with the struggles of adolescence. Our students can get it because they relate to Anne. Using Anne, we can steer our, steer our students to questions of their own rights as people, but also the universal questions of right and wrong. The fact that she is so eloquent a writer is just a bonus to the life lessons she teaches. It's not an exaggeration to say that Anne has become one of the most influential people of the 20th century, certainly the most influential child, because of the many people who have shared her sorrows and her joys, her hopes and her fears. Although Anne's diary in itself could be a Holocaust unit, it can also be instrumental in creating a much larger Holocaust lesson. By mixing the, her literature to the history of the times, we make cross curricular connections that enrich our students' learning. We can use Anne's diary to begin our unit, continue our study of her words as we introduce historic anti-Semitism and its rise in 19th and 20th century Europe, and compare her hopes and fears with what is happening in the world outside of the annex. As we look at incarceration, liberation, and their aftermath, we remember it was Anne who wrote, where there's hope, there's life. It fills us with courage and makes us strong again. There'll never be a time when that quote is not important. Emotionally, we enter a minefield with her, and with one brilliant sentence, she brings us out whole. In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Father Neiman is going to speak to, the, to us today about Meep Geese. Meep once said, I don't like being called a hero because no one should ever think you have to be special to help others. Anne Frank is a hero, not because she was different or better than us. She's a hero because she really was just like each of us. Father John Neiman, who's to my right, was born in Santa Monica, California in 1953. He attended Hardin Simmons University in Abilene, Texas, where he earned his BA and MA degrees in history. He entered St. John Seminary in Camarillo, California in 1980 and was ordained a Catholic priest on February 1st, 1986. He served various parishes in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, as well as one year serving as the, in the Diocese of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. In 2014, he went on medical leave. Father John went through five surgeries from 2014 to 2018 before retiring in 2018. He then moved to Chester, West Virginia in September 2020 and is now a proud West Virginian. Currently, Father John helps out at some of the local parishes in that region and is hoping to start traveling once again. Father John first met Otto Frank in June 1976 and the two became close friends. He and Otto remained in touch and saw each other twice more before Otto's death in 1980. It was something Otto said to Father John that inspired him to become a Roman Catholic priest. Father John kept in close contact with Otto's widow Fritzi and visited several times before her death in 1998. Father John also formed a close relationship with Meep and Jan Geis. Meep and Jan came all the way from Amsterdam to Los Angeles for Father John's ordination in 1986, and years later, Father John was present at Meep's 100th birthday party in Hume, the Netherlands, in 2009. His friendship with Otto, Meep, Jan, Otto, Fritzi, Meep, and Jan continues to be a, a great source of inspiration in his life. On behalf of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, it is my honor to welcome Father John Neiman. Thank you. It's a, truly an honor and a privilege to be here today in this beautiful theater on this beautiful campus in beautiful Pittsburgh, which I'm getting to know, although I must admit I'm glad I don't have to drive here. Uh, it's a little confusing, but it's a beautiful city. And uh, as um, Dan told you, I now live in West Virginia. My mom actually is from West Virginia, so I have deep roots in the northern panhandle. And I'm very, very happy to be here to talk to you about my friendship with Otto Frank and with Meep and uh, a little bit more about the Anne story. And 
Of course, there, you know, most of you probably know the basic story. I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to skip ahead and tell you a story Otto told me about the publication of the diary, because today, June 12th, would have been Anne's 93rd birthday. And June 25th will be the 75th anniversary of the publication of the Diary of Anne Frank, which of course was published originally in Dutch under Anne, the title that Anne chose for her novel, Het Actehuis, which means in Dutch, the house behind, which is where they hid, or the back house, which is the part of the building they hid in. But when Otto um, received Anne's diary after he found out that Anne was not coming back from Bergen-Belsen, he of course read it, but he, he had no intention at all of publishing it. But over the next several months, he copied out sections of the diary. He translated part of it for his mother and his sister and brother who were living in, in Basel in Switzerland and had survived the war. And uh, some of his friends started to say to him, you need to publish this. This you need to share with the world. And Otto thought, well, first he thought, no, but then he said, so he decided, Otto told me, he said, I'm going to go and talk to everybody that knew Anne and who I know who are my friends and find out what they think. So he went to everybody he could think of, you know, those who had survived and those, this, those who he knew and that Anne had known. And he, he said to me, you know, John, 50% of the people that I talked to said, oh, yes, yes, you've got to publish this diary. And the other 50% said, no, no, nobody's going to want to read the words of a teenager. This is crazy. And he, he stopped and he looked at me with that kind of a twinkle in his eye. And he said, aren't you glad I listened to the people who said yes? And I said, oh, yes, Otto, I think we're all glad. And of course, he did decide to publish the diary in 1947. And it is still, as far as I know, it is still the second biggest non-fiction uh, selling book in the world. Of course, the Bible, still number one, and uh, which is a good thing, but, but the Diary of Anne Frank has been published in um, more than, uh, I think, 60 languages, and it's even been published in North Korea. Because when I visited North Korea in 2012, I was able to buy a couple of uh, editions of the diary. So it's had a tremendous impact, as you know. I first read the diary when I was in fifth grade, which is a little young, but I, I was very intrigued by it, very moved by it. So I started going to the library. This is in the 60s when there wasn't a lot of Holocaust literature out there, but I went and I, I read everything I could, everything that I could find about the Holocaust and about Anne Frank. And then when I was in college in the 70s, I'm, I'm not even sure the exact reason why at that point, but I decided to write a letter to Otto Frank to let him know how much the diary had, had meant to me and had an impact on my life. And so I wrote a letter and he wrote back, very, very nice letter. And I wrote back to him and he wrote back to me, but he said, you know, it's wonderful that, that you think about Anne and that you write to me, but I can't keep up a correspondence with people because I get hundreds and hundreds of letters. So I said, okay, that's all right. Don't worry about it. I'll write. You don't have to answer. But of course he did. He always answered my letters and through the mail we became very good friends. In one of his letters he said, you know, if you ever come to Switzerland, you should come and visit me. Come and meet me and, and my wife, my second wife. And so I, I did, I planned a trip to the Netherlands so I could go to the Anne Frank house and then I came down to Switzerland where I first met Otto. And as you know, there were eight people in hiding in that back house, the Acta house from July 6th, 1942 to August 4th, 1944, when they were betrayed and arrested and deported. And the eight of them were part of the very last transport that left the Netherlands for Auschwitz on September the 3rd, 1944. There were 1,019 people on that transport. Of that number, 127 came back, including Otto Frank. But his wife, Edith, his daughters, Anne and Margot, Mr. and Mrs. Von Pels, their son, Peter, and the dentist, uh, uh, Dr. Pfeffer, were all, all died in the camps. So Otto came back alone. When he came back, he was liberated at Auschwitz on January the 27th, 1945, by the Red Army. And he had been in the 
um, hospital block at the time and was very, very weak and very, very sick, but he was not able, fortunately, to go on the death march, which most of the other prisoners uh, went, the, the Nazis took them on a death march um, going west back into Germany where many, many thousands died or were killed along the way until they could get to other camps. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. But he, um, it took four months to get home and he arrived back in Amsterdam on June the 3rd, 1945, and he went to Mipinyan because he had nowhere to go. And he ended up living with Mipinyan for seven years. But the very next day that he returned, he went back to work, right back to work in the building that had been his office and his hiding place. And he told me, he said, you know, I felt very responsible to the people who had hid me and risked their lives to hide me and my family. So I went back to work and of course he started searching uh, for Anne and Margaret. He knew that Edith had died. He had found that, found that out from one of Edith's friends who had been with her. In fact, Edith died in her arms just three weeks before Auschwitz was liberated. So he knew his wife was dead, but he still hoped that the girls would come through, that they would survive. And in, on July 18th, 1945, he um, came across, he got in contact with a, a lady who had known Anne and Margaret and Bergen-Belsen and knew that the girls had both died. So he got the final uh, word that his girls would not be coming back. And Meep, who actually, Meep and Bep, the two secretaries, saved the diary. When the family was arrested on August the 4th, 1944, the Gestapo sergeant who arrested them was looking for something to put the family's valuables in. And Anne always kept her diary when she wasn't writing it and in her father's briefcase because she knew she could trust her father never to read, to look in and to read the diary, and he never did. So he opened it and thought, saw what he thought were worthless papers he dumped them on the floor and uh, proceeded to put the whatever valuables that the family had. And that afternoon, Meep, Meep and Bep were not arrested. Uh, the two men, uh, Mr. Kugler and Mr. Kleinman, were arrested and, and spent time in prison and in concentration camps, but in the Netherlands, and they both survived. But they, Meep knew that Anne kept a diary, so she recognized that all this mess on the floor, so she gathered everything up, and she took it downstairs, put it in her desk, and she told me, she said, my great dream was that when Anne came back, I would open my desk drawer, I would say, take out the diary and say, look, look, Anne, I saved your diary, and to see the smile on her face. But of course, that, she knew that would not happen, so that's when she gave the diary to Otto. She didn't tell Otto about the diary until after he found out that his girls would not be coming back. So she gave him the diary at, at that point. And I uh, had decided when I went to Switzerland, or I, I went to Switzerland and I got to meet Otto and I spent a, a wonderful day with him and Fritzi, his second wife, who he married in 1953. Mm -hmm. And her story was very much parallel. She and her family were in hiding, although there was a little bit different for them. She and her daughter were in one place and her husband and son were in another hiding place. She had a daughter Anne's age, uh, her name is Eva, and Eva just celebrated her 93rd birthday on May 11th. She lives in London. And she, um, they, but they, they ended up being both being betrayed, both uh, the, the parents, uh, the father, the mother, and, and the two, brother and sister. And they went in May of 44 to Auschwitz. They survived. They survived and were liberated also at, at Auschwitz by the Red Army in uh, January of 45. Her husband and her son uh, were, were killed. In fact, the records, the Red Cross records show that her son, who was 18 at the time, actually died after he was liberated. So um, terrible sadness there. But they found each other after the war and they got married. They had 27 years of, of happiness together after all that grief and all that suffering. And she was a, she was a lovely lady. And she was, um, I got to be, one, after Otto died, I used to still go to visit her. And one day when I was with her, she looked at me. She had a puzzled look on her face. And she goes, uh, Father John, you are celibate, right? Celibate? 
And I go, yes, I'm, I'm celibate. I, I took a vow of celibacy. And she goes, yes, you are celibate? And I go, yes. He goes, no, I don't think so. Nobody, nobody can do that. It's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. You can't do it. And I said, oh, no, I've been very good. I've been faithful. to." No, no, nobody can do that. You can't do it. But um, she was a wonderful, bo both of them had a, a wonderful, wonderful sense of humor and were very kind. I think the thing that struck me most about Otto was that, you know how there's some people when you meet them and after five minutes you feel like you've known them all your life. They're just so warm and kind and, and welcoming. You just feel... You just feel like they've been part of your circle, your circle of life and your family and friends forever. And that's how Otto and Fritzi were. They were very, very kind, very welcoming. And of course, we talked and talked and talked for hours. I wanted to know everything. And uh, eventually, of course, and Otto, the only thing that Otto would not talk about is that he said to me when I asked him about the betrayal, and he said, no, please don't, don't ask me about that. I don't, I don't talk about that. So I, I didn't ask him anymore. But then eventually I asked him, I said, you know, Otto, tell me about, would you t tell me about what it was like for you in Auschwitz, in, in the camps? And he stopped and he said, you know, I never, I never talk about that. I, I always tell people, you can go to the library and get a book. I never talk about Auschwitz. And I, and I, I was thinking to myself when he was saying that, I said, oh, I've, I've blown it. I've really blown it now. And, but he paused and he said, you know, because you love Anne so much, I will tell you. I will tell you about it. And he proceeded to tell me uh, what it was, you know, that horrible journey for three days and three nights in the cattle car with no food or no water. And, and then, of course, being separated from his family and the terrible beatings he received and how he was just about ready to give up when a Dutch doctor who was a prisoner there came and was able to get him admitted into the we say hospital with quotes there was no treatment of any kind but at least you didn't have to go out on work details anymore so the um and the one time that I was with Otto and the three times I visited him the one time when he thought when it looked like he was going to break down was when he told me about Peter now, you remember Peter was the son of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Von Pels, who Anne ha uh, was, was madly in love with for a brief period there in, in the um, hiding place when they were hiding. And Peter had actually a privileged job at Auschwitz, and he was able to get extra food. So he used to bring food every day to Otto in the hospital. And as the Russians were approaching and the Nazis were preparing to evacuate the camp, Otto said to Peter, said, look, Peter, come and hide here in the hospital because there's so much confusion. Nobody will miss you. Nobody will know. You'll be safe here. You'll be safe here. If you go, if you go in the snow in the march, you, you won't make it. And he said, no, no, I'm young. I'm strong. I, I can do it. I can still work. If they catch me here, they'll shoot me. And he said, I just, I tried. So I begged Peter. I said, please don't. Peter, stay here. Stay here. And he said, no, 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 I have to go. I have to go. So Peter went on the death march. He ended up at a camp called Mauthausen in Austria, and he died on May the 5th, 1945, the day that General Patton's troops liberated the camp. So, um, and, and that was the one time when he looked like he really was going to lose it because Peter would be 96. He could still, you know, be alive today. That wouldn't be that, that unusual, somebody um, living to be 96 today. But um, he did tell me in, in detail. And then Fritzi told me her story uh, after, after Otto finished. Fritzi, uh, Fritzi is probably the only uh, Jewish prisoner who was at Auschwitz that was saved from the gas chamber twice in one day. Her cousin, Minnie, who she was reunited with at Auschwitz, was a nurse, and she was put in charge by Dr. Mengele, who was the angel of death, the, the doctor there, the head doctor at Auschwitz, of the women's hospital block. And Fritzi was chosen, was what they called it selected, uh, one evening in, in a, a selection after a work detail to go to the gas chamber. So Eva, her daughter, snuck out of the barracks, went to Minnie and said, Minnie, you know, my mother goes tomorrow to the gas chamber. Can you can you uh, do anything? So she went to Dr. Mengele, and she said, you know, my cousin is here. She's got blonde hair. She has blue eyes. She's still strong to work. And so the next morning, Mengele sent someone to 
pull her out of that group of women that were waiting to go to the gas chamber. But that night at roll call, the, um, the, the guard from the, from the place where the women were taken after they were selected, before the trucks came to take them to the gas chamber, she came and said, I, I'm too short for my consignment. So she looked right at Fritzi and another lady standing next to her and said, you, you come. So here she was back in the same, that same barrack waiting now and then the trucks drove up and there was an SS woman guard sitting at a small table and as the women were filing by they had to show their number and she checked their number off of course because the Nazis everything had to be in perfect order. And that other lady, her name was Loretta who was with Fritzi, said no, 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 we're not supposed to be here. Look, our numbers aren't on your list. And she went down and saw that and Fritzi showed her her number and that's right they, it wasn't her turn to die so instead of you would think that they would just add their numbers to the list and send them on but thank God they didn't do that it wasn't her turn so so twice in one day she got out of going to the gas chamber and then her cousin uh, Minnie came and took her to the hospital block but she and Eva were both still alive and they met um, they met up with Otto on the way back to the Netherlands but um, one, of, one, of my, um, one of my most wonderful memories of Otto, he had a great sense of humor. And after all he had suffered, you know, I found it so amazing to be in his presence because he had suffered so much, but he was so uh, kind and good and compassionate. And I'd asked him, I said, well, Otto, did you ever see the play? And he said, no, no, I never, ever saw the play. And I said, well, how about the movie, the George Stevens movie? And he said, no, no, I never, ever saw it. But he said, I did go, I did go to Hollywood. And he told me, he sat up in his chair and he goes, you know what, John? We flew, Fritzi and I flew first class on the airplane. When we got to the airport in Los Angeles, there was there a limousine to meet us. We stayed only in the finest hotels and ate only at the finest restaurants. But I said, they wasted all their money because they didn't listen to anything I told them. Yeah. And uh, what, what, he was, what he was hoping to get George Stevens to do, not to change any of the technical parts of the movie, but just to change the, some of the script where there were discrepancies in the historical accuracy of the story. And he was really hoping that he could convince George Stevens to do that. But, uh, George Stevens was not willing to do that, so um, he kept the script, basically he kept the script from the play. And the movie he made technically was a masterpiece, there's no doubt about that. But Otto, Otto said, I never ever could bear to, to sit through, you know, and see my family being portrayed up there on the stage or on the screen. So he never, he never saw the movie, but he did send, um, when the play opened on Broadway in 1955, The Diary of Anne Frank, he sent a congratulatory telegram to the cast and, and the crew uh, for, for this. And he was very grateful that um, the play was going to be done, but he just said he could never see it. But <clears throat> I spent a, a wonderful, wonderful day with him and Fritzi, and then I got to see him on two other occasions, once in London in 1979, at Eva's home, and it was there. Um, I became Catholic in 1976. I'm a convert, and I started thinking right away of, of, of the priesthood. And the priest that I talked to said, "Well, take some time, get involved in your parish, pray about it, and and you know, see what you think. See if you think the Lord is calling you." And I was talking with Otto, and I say, and, and I was going on about about you know my admiration for Anne and. He stopped me right in mid-sentence and he said, you know, it's wonderful that you love my family, that you think about them and that you remember the Holocaust and, and think about all those people who died. But he said, if you really want to honor their memory, you'll do what Anne wanted to do with her life, live your life doing good for other people. And when he said that to me, I knew at, from that moment on, I knew for me that was going to be priesthood. And so I, um, when I came back home, I, I called the, the rector of the seminary and filled out my applications, had my psychological exam, which I passed, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, entered the seminary in 1980. And I always think about how God used Otto Frank as an instrument to help me make that decision to become a priest. 
And in 1986, when I was ordained, Meep and Jan Gies came all the way from Amsterdam to be at my ordination. I had gotten to know, Otto is the one who said to me, you know, you go to Amsterdam all the time. Why don't you go see Meep? So in 1980, I met Meep, and we became very, very good friends. She, again, was like, um, you just felt to be in her presence, not only in the presence of, of a, a someone, a great person, but, but a very good-hearted, kind, loving person. And you know, there were many, many, many people in the Netherlands who risked their lives hiding Jews during the war. And they didn't do it so someone would make a movie about them or write a book about them. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do. And, and Meep always resisted anybody writing her story because she said, there are many people who did what I did. Somebody should write a book about them. But finally, uh, a friend of mine, an author, Alison Leslie Gold, who I had connected with Meep, finally she, Meep agreed to let her write uh, her story, and it's called Anne Frank Remembered. And that came out, I think, right around the time I was ordained, that that book came out. And then they made a, a movie, Mary Steenburgen played the part of Meep in that movie. But Meep always said, don't call me a hero, I'm not a hero said, I imagined many sleepless nights if I had turned my back on my friends when they needed me. And she said, I'm not a hero because many, many people did what I did. And many of those people paid the ultimate price. I was lucky. I was never arrested. I never went to camp. But many, many did. In the Netherlands, during the Second World War, there were anywhere between, they don't know the exact number, between about 25 and 30,000 Jews who went into hiding. And of that number, between about, uh, about 12,000, 13,000 were discovered, mostly through betrayal, which unfortunately, while there were many good people, there were many people who weren't good and were very willing to turn in uh, their Jewish compatriots for a, a, a handsome reward that the Gestapo offered for those who, um, and that reward got bigger and bigger as the war, the war went on. But uh, Meep uh, resisted that. She always said, don't, don't call me a hero. And she was, uh, um, I loved visiting with her because she, she was full of life and she was, she, you could tell she had a good heart and she was very stubborn. She was very stubborn. When her husband Jan, who was in, in actually in the Dutch underground, in the resistance during the war while she uh, was hiding the Franks and the Von Pels family. When he got very sick, um, Meep wanted to keep him at home. She didn't want him to, she wanted to care for him at home. And one of her best friends said, you know, Meep, you can't do this. We need to hire a nurse to come in and be here 24 hours a day with Jan. And she, she looked at him and she said, no, if you do that, then I'll have three people to take care of. So she was, uh, she was a, a, an amazing lady. And she, um, one of the things that she, she loved, she loved to go exploring and she loved to, to take me on walks through Amsterdam. And every time I went to Amsterdam, she always took me on a tour of the Anne Frank house. She, every time, no matter, even though it got to be where it was probably 10, 11, 12 times, she always said, yes, I will take you, I will take you. And she showed me where she found the diary, and she showed me and, and told me about all of the different things that were going on, and, you know, the other side of the bookcase, you know, from her side. And, of course, that, that terrible day when the Gestapo came to arrest them. And Meep actually was, originally, she was born in Vienna, and when she was 11 years old, after the First World War, there was a program in the Netherlands where Dutch families took in uh, children from Austria for six months because Austria, of course, was one of the losers in the First World War, and there was terrible hunger there after the war. So 1920, she came as an 11-year-old child with a tag around her neck. They put her on the train, went to Holland, the Netherlands, and a, a Dutch family took her in. But after six months, she decided she wanted to stay in the Netherlands. So her parents let her stay. So she was, from the time she was 11, she was raised in the Netherlands. And she recognized the, the Gestapo sergeant who led the arrest party on that day, on August 4th, was Sergeant Silberbauer, who was from Vienna. And she recognized, she heard him speaking on the stairwell, and she said, you know, to herself, I recognize that accent. 
So when he came in to interrogate her, she said, she, Meep was very short. She said, I stood up as tall as I could and I said, you are a Vienna, I'm a Vienna too. And she said that he just stopped in his tracks. He didn't know uh, what, what to say. And, and she was thinking to herself here that he was probably saying, you know, here are two people from the same place. One wants to kill the Jews, the other wants to save them. And he screamed and yelled at her for several minutes, but then he said, just out of personal sympathy, I'll let you go. But you come back here to work every single day. You come every day or we'll deport your husband. So Meep, of course, well, she had to keep the business going, so she came every day. But she and Bep, the other secretary, went upstairs. And I, as I'm telling you, that's, they're the ones that found Anne's diary and saved it. And I asked Meep, I said, well, Meep, during all those months, you know, the remainder of the war, weren't you curious about Anne's diary? Didn't you read it? And she goes, no, I felt very strongly it was private. It was her diary, even though it was the words of a child, that I should respect that privacy. And she said, you know, if I had read it at that time, I would have burned it. Because my husband's name, the names of all the people that hid them, that, that supplied food to them, all those names were listed in that diary. And so she said, I would have burned it. So again, because of her sense of dignity and honor, you know, was saved. That's why we have the diary today is because, because of her. And with Otto, the last time I saw Otto was in 1980 in May, just a few months before he died. He was very, um, very weak. He was very sick and it was a very short visit. But um, in fact, Fritzi told me when I got there, she said, you know, he's sleeping right now and I'll have to ask him. I'll have to see if it's okay when he wakes up. And, and Fritzi came back out and I said, oh yes, yes, he wants to see you, he wants to see you. So he, he, he came out and we had a, a wonderful, wonderful visit. I got to, to see him and to, uh, you know, re, it was just, I knew it would be the last time that I would ever see him. And we had a, a wonderful visit, very wonderful visit. And again, um, to be in his presence, he was one of these people that you really, um, you can see where Anne got that, um, notion that you know when she said just just three weeks before the arrest that you know i still believe that in spite of everything that people are really good at heart and i'm sure she must have been thinking about her father and her mother as well because her mother was a very very good-hearted person but uh, otto died in august of 1980 he was 91 years old he had lived 35 years after his liberation and fritzi fritzi lived to see her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. She died in 1998, she was 93. So even after all of that suffering, all of that heartbreak, all of that loss, they had found, they had a wonderful life together. And Otto always looked upon Eva, uh, Fritzi's daughter, and her children as his, his daughter and grandchildren. And it gave him, another, again, another another purpose for living, another reason to, to be alive and to enjoy life and to um, be able to, um, you know, have a family, have a family to love. So he, he was very, um, he was very glad to have that. And he, and, he and Fritzi, they made, they really were made for each other. They made a wonderful, wonderful couple and they had, they were very happy together. And Otto answered personally every single letter he received over the years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. He told me I would sit at my desk and I would dictate to Fritzi. And for those of you who are old enough to remember typewriters, she would type, type the letter out and then he would look it over and, and see if anything needed to be changed and then he would sign it. But every single letter that he ever received, he answered. So I, I was very impressed with that because that took, you know, a lot of time. And of course, every time he received a letter, it reopened all of those wounds because he had to think about his family and what he had lost and what was no longer there, but he was willing to do it. He, he really, really saw Anne's diary as a means of fostering a brotherhood and sisterhood throughout the world, tolerance, peace, understanding because the letters came from just about everywhere every country every culture every language every religion 
it uh, transcended all the kind of barriers that we put up that keep people apart. And sometimes he told me, sometimes he and Fritzi would come home if they were away for a week visiting family in London or off on a little vacation, they'd come home and there'd be somebody sitting on their doorstep <laughs> wanting to, to meet them and to talk with them. And of course, he always welcomed everybody, everybody who, who came. And I feel very blessed that I had the opportunity not only to get to know him, but, but become a very close friend. And he had a and continue to, continues to have a very big impact on my life. And as well as Meep, I, I had the privilege of being at Meep's 100th birthday party on February the 13th, 2009. And I was one of three non-family members that were invited to be there with Meep and her son and daughter-in-law and her three grandchildren, who were that by that time, of course, were grown. And we had a, a, a wonderful celebration. You'll see a, uh, in one of my pictures, you'll see her cutting her, her um, son and daughter-in-law got her a cake and in the shape of, it had 100 on it, and it shows her, her cutting the cake. And she was, uh, um, again, an amazing lady, very humble, very, very gracious, very loving, and, um, and very good, very good. She was a good friend, and of course, to have them at my ordination was um, probably the greatest gift I told somebody, I said, it would have been nice to have the Pope here, but even if the Pope had come, I'm still more excited that Meep and Jan are here. <laughs> so it was wonderful to have them at, uh, at my ordination and the, the impact that they had on my life. So I'm going to check my watch now to make sure that I'm not going overtime. Okay, I'm okay. When um, Meep and Jan um, came to California, I had the opportunity, of course, to, to show them around and to take them to various places and they loved, uh, they loved going to Universal Studios and they loved Disneyland and they loved seeing all the sights out there. And, uh, but they, they, weren't, they weren't crazy about the way we prepare our food in California. And they said, no, no, we don't, it, it, it's okay, but we, we, prefer, we prefer our food in the Netherlands. But they were, um, there was, it was wonderful to have, to have them with me during those days. And I used to go, when I used to go to see Meep, she would always, and say, I said, Meep, let me, you know, let me take you out to dinner. And she goes, no, no, I'm going to cook for you tonight. And she would cook these wonderful, wonderful Dutch dishes. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Dutch cuisine, but they have a, um, a split pea soup. It's called erte soup. And it's, it's very good. It's very thick, and it has big pieces of sausage in it. And it, it, it's very, very good. And then they have... In the Netherlands, they have a, a cabbage. It's called boerenkool, which means farmer's cabbage. And it's a special, it's like kale. And in the winter time, they have a dish where they dig it out of the frozen ground and they cut it up and they mix it up with uh, mashed potatoes and um, sausage. And it's, it's, oh boy, is it good. Of course, I, uh, I, I can't eat like that anymore. But it, at, that, at that time, it was, it, was, it was wonderful to be able to enjoy that and she would always be so thrilled and it was interesting because she had lived through the hunger winter which the last winter of the war in the Netherlands the Germans cut off all the food supplies to the big city so thousands and thousands of people died in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht in the western part of the country where most of the the biggest part of the population was over about 25,000 people starved to death that last winter of the war so she would never throw anything out. And she would always look at me and she said, if I didn't clean my plate, she would say, it's obvious that no time in your life have you ever been hungry. And I said, well, that's true, Meep. I don't think I ever have been hungry. And she, so she had, even, even if bread went bad, some if went bad, she put it on the windowsill for the birds to come to eat. So it, it, she said, oh, I, ne I never, ever, ever throw anything away, ever. And she had all kinds of, when she went back up uh, stairs to the hiding place uh, a couple of days later, she went around, she told me she went around and she tried to take something that belonged to each of the people in hiding. So when they came back, she, you know, there would be something, something she could give them of their possessions because it was uh, customary that a moving van would show up a few days later and remove everything. Jews in hiding was called, uh, Abraham Pulse was the name of the company, and it was called Pulsing, Pulsing a House. And they would come and take all of the, all of the possessions. 
So she went, she got a, a combing shawl that Anne had that had an AF sewn into it, and she got a Spanish book. Uh, Dr. Pfeffer was hoping to immigrate to South America, so he was trying to teach himself how to speak Spanish. And he, um, she, and she had a prayer book that had be, uh, belonged to Mrs. Frank, and she tried to take something that uh, would belong, uh, belong of each of them, so she'd have something to, to give back to them. But she and Bep kept the business going during the, that, those terrible months of the hunger winter, and when Otto came back, the business was still there, and he felt it was his obligation to keep the business going. But then after the diary was published, more and more people would show up at the door wanting to see the hiding place, wanting to see the annex, and of course, you know, go behind the bookcase. And so he would, he or one of the others would give them a tour. And in 1960, they opened up uh, the uh, Anne Frank House. They opened up the, the building to the general public and established the Anne Frank Foundation. That opened in May of 1960. And in 2019, you know, the last year before the pandemic, there were over a million visitors to see. In fact, they, they got to the place where they had to, because the, if you've ever been there, the rooms are very small and very narrow, so they don't hold a lot of people. So you have to, so they had to start, you know, spacing it out and only sending up so many people at a time because it got, it would get too, um, too crowded. But it, of course, now it's open again, and the, the people are starting to, the visitors are starting to return. But again, that was his dream that, um, that they could keep alive, you know, because so many people wanted to see where they hid. And the, the pictures that Anne put along the wall in her room of movie stars of that day and uh, paint, paintings that she liked and, and the, the Dutch royal family. In fact, there's even a picture of, of uh, little Princess Elizabeth at that time during the war, she was Princess Elizabeth on, on the wall there, and they're still there to see. And the map that Otto Frank put on the wall there from the newspaper after, um, in the weeks following D-Day, showing with, with pins the advance of the Americans and the British and the Canadians through France on their way. Of course, they were all on their way to the Netherlands, which of course they didn't get there in time to save, to save the Franks. But, um, Actually, the Netherlands, France and Belgium were liberated there in August and September of 44, but the Netherlands, the southern part of the Netherlands was liberated in 44, but the, the northern part stayed under occupation all the way till, till May of 45. So there was a, a lot, as I said, like with the hunger and a lot, a lot of suffering still in those, um, those big cities and now those parts, the, the, the northern part of the country. But I want to stop now, and I have some I have some pictures to show you. And I have to be able to to tell what the picture is, so I can't. You're gonna see, you're gonna see my head at the bottom of the screen, but I think you'll still see be able to see the picture. Well, at least I hope so. We'll see what happens. But uh, This is Otto Frank. Otto Frank is on my right here, and in this solo here, that's his brother Herbert. That's their World War I German Army uniforms, because Otto was a proud German. His family had been in Germany for centuries.
if anybody has any questions, and I think they want you to come to one of either of the microphones here. Uh, so if you, if you have any questions th that you'd like to, to ask, I'd be glad to, to try and answer them. Okay, well, I can, I, I can uh, go on talking if you want for a little while during question time, or if you, <laughs> no, no questions? Okay. You can have this open mic there. Yeah. Thank you very oh, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, June 25th uh, will be the 75th anniversary of the publication of the diary. And when it was first published, it was a firm called Contact in Amsterdam. Actually, several publishers turned Otto down uh, for the very same reason that some of his friends had said. They said nobody, first of all, they said nobody wants to hear about the war anymore. They want to move on. They don't want to hear about the war. But he said nobody is going to read the diary of a teenager. So they turned it down, and the small publishing house in Amsterdam called Contact published, they published the diary. They printed 1,500 editions. Of course, in, what Otto had to do is that um, he had to edit the diary because Anne, what Anne did, she got her diary as a birthday present on her 13th birthday, which was June 12, 1942. And it was a, a little red checkered book with a little lock on it. And when she filled that up, the uh, girl, she was in hiding by then, uh, Meep and Beb gave her ledger books from the office, blank ledger books. Uh, and then she also wrote in you know, about 300, 300 uh, bl uh, loose pages. But in, on March the 29th, 1944, they were listening to a broadcast of Radio Oranje. Now that was the Dutch broadcast from England. Every night they broadcast had a 15-minute uh, um, program to you know, try to keep up the morale. Queen Wilhelmina spoke often on those broadcasts, and of course they gave them the true news of what was going on in the war. And the this is the Dutch government in exile. The Dutch Minister for Culture and Education said that people should save their letters and their diaries so that after the war we have a more complete record of how people lived, what happened, not just from historians or, um, uh, you know, teachers and things like that, but from the ordinary person. So that's when Anne decided that she wanted to uh, write a novel. She wanted to write a novel based on uh, her diary. So like any good student, those of you who are teachers, you know that, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, uh, assign an essay and then maybe you'll give the the students a chance to go back and maybe correct it or rewrite it or, or you know, do it over, make it a little bit more presentable. So Anne went back and started um, uh, crossing things out, adding things, rewriting things, you know, sort of self, you know, editing her own diary. And so we have, we have what we call version A and version B of the diary. Now, when Otto went to publish the diary, there was, it, at that time, you know, it was just post-war Netherlands. First of all, there wasn't enough paper to publish a big, thick, you know, book like that, you know, in mass. So he edited the diary, and we have what we call the C version, or the popular version that's been out there all these years. And so he took some, you know, some things from the A version, some things from the B version, and he created what, what he didn't call it C, but I mean, it, it's come to be called the C version. Um, of course, she never finished the novel. She, you know, they were betrayed and arrested. But he chose, she chose that title, Het Acta House. That's what she was going to call her novel. So he chose that as the title for the diary when it was, when it was published. Now, in English, it's the diary of Anne Frank or the diary of a young girl. But in Dutch, it's still Het Acta House, the, the back house. In 1980, when Otto died, he willed the diary to the Dutch government. And the Dutch government um, embarked on a very ambitious um, 
project where they were going to combine all of Anne's writings, because she also wrote a number of short stories, as well as keeping a diary. She wrote a number of, of, of short stories and essays. And they also subjected the diary to a very exhaustive um, handwriting analysis, because all throughout, since the diary was published, Otto was always in court, it seemed like, you know, fighting back against people who claimed that the diary was a forgery, that Anne had not written the diary, that either he had written the diary or someone else had written it. And so they did an exhaustive uh, handwriting analysis and, and uh, published it. What the Dutch government did is they published everything that Anne wrote. In, and at the beginning of the book is an introduction of, of the life in hiding and then the afterward, what happened to the family after they were arrested, and the results of this handwriting analysis is also published there. So everything that Anne wrote is in that, you can buy that edition. It's, it looks like a, a you know, size of a dictionary. It's, it's quite, because Anne was very, very prolific. And um, one, of the th one of the essays that she wrote is an essay called Give. She was 14 years old, and she was talking about how everybody, everybody can help those who are less fortunate. She said, even if you don't have any money to give, you can give a smile, you can give uh, something to eat, you can give, give a hand. And she, she said, nobody ever became poor by giving. And which is remarkable, she was only 14 years old and she was living in this, the, this terrible um, tension and, and, and circumstances and yet she thought about um, other people and people who were suffering and she said you know if everybody if everybody did that then there wouldn't then eventually there wouldn't be any more she she didn't say homeless she said beggars there wouldn't be any more beggars around that would need help because they they would have gotten all the help that they need so she was a um, a remarkable remarkable girl but she was also very much a teenager because in the in the very beginning of her diary this is before they went into hiding, she wrote a paragraph about all of the students in her class, uh, like a critique. And uh, some of it was not very complimentary. And Otto chose not to publish that. Uh, it, it's in, it's in the, um, the, to the whole version, yes, the, if you buy that. But she, <laughs> she wrote about, you know, she said, that, that girl thinks that, that all the boys like her, but behind their back, they're making fun of her, and she's got, she's got buck teeth, and she's got this and this, and she just, and it was funny, she just goes on and on about, uh, you know, all of these things. Now, now they'd be doing it on social media, you know, you'd see it in social media, but, um, so anyway, she, but, so she, but she, as she matured, and as she, of course, matured very quickly in the hiding place, she had a lot of dreams. She really wanted to make a difference in the world. She said, I want to live my life doing good for other people. And I want to go on living even after my death. And Otto had no idea that she felt that deeply about these things because she never expressed it. Anne always felt, you know, she was the youngest and everybody thought, oh, she's just a child and nobody took her seriously. So she thought, if I tell people what I'm really thinking and my deep thoughts, they'll just laugh at me. And my mother will tell me I'm constipated, you know. So she never, she just never revealed that side. She revealed it in the diary. But she said, Otto said it was only after I read Anne's diary that I knew. She had a very deep faith in God, very, very deep faith. She came to believe very strongly in God, even though she wasn't a religious person. She and Otto very rarely went to temple. Her mother and Margaret used to go to temple quite frequently, but she and Otto would always stay home. And but she developed a very a very deep faith in God. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did Otto ever share the diary with me? Yes. Actually, what happened was, I got the day my first visit in 1976. He kept at that time. Now he kept the diary in a safety deposit box. All of Anne's writings in safety deposit in a bank in Basel, and. He, the next day, someone from Dutch television was coming to interview him, and they were coming early. So he had gone the day before and gotten um, uh, the, the diary. He got, actually got the, red, the actual diary and one of the ledger books, not all of her writings. So he happened to have it in the house the day that I came to see him. So he didn't tell me about it. He, after dinner, 
he took me in the office and he said, I, I want you know, to, to show you something. And he brought it out because he had a facsimile made of everything that Anne wrote and in the same bindings and everything. It looks just like the real diary and, and it's her writings, but it's a, a copy. And, and I said, oh, Otto, is this? and he said, yes, this is Anne's, this is her diary. So I got to sit there in the office and I was kind of, I think, like in a trance because I wasn't expecting that and to actually to see the actual diary. I mean, I would have been content with the facsimile, but uh, to see the actual diary and then the, the ledger book, it was actually a book of, uh, that had her essays and her stories in it. And so I did, yes, I had the wonderful privilege of being able to, to, to hold the diary in my hands. And if you go to Amsterdam to the Anne Frank House, they have the, the diary encased in a, a, a special climate controlled case and you can, you know, you can see it there. Yes. How did it come to be translated in other languages? And what were some of the first languages that the diary was translated to? And what kind of interest was there for it to be translated and widespread throughout the world? Well, it, it, the, translation, the translation of the diary, the first, I think the first the first two translations were in German and in French, and then very soon after that in English. In the, in the early 1950, er, early on, and just a few years after the Dutch edition, Otto felt it was very important to be read in Germany. So they, it was very hard to find a publisher because in those years, no one wanted to talk about the Holocaust. No one wanted, in Germany, no one wanted to acknowledge it or, or be confronted with it in, in those years. It's different now, but in those years, that's how it was. But he found a publisher, and, and not only was the diary published there, I think in 1950, but the play was produced there later on, not too long after the um, play came out you know, on Broadway. Then there was a French edition, and then it was published in England, an English edition. And then in 1952, it was published in the United States. In, of course, in English. And I, I really don't, I don't know a lot of details about how it came to be. I think it's just because so many people were reading the diary and wanted to read the diary that he was approached by um, publishers all over the world. And then it, and I said it got to be translated into, I think, I think about 65 languages. And like I said, was even saying that even in North Korea, which very rarely publishes Western books, uh, has published published the diary, but it 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 came to be. I think that that a lot of publishers. I think Otto went out and tried to to seek publishers, but then there were people seeking him out as well, because they wanted to, they felt that it would be it would would sell very well, which it which it did. But I I don't know a lot of details of how it came to be in in those other in those other languages. Yes. Uh, you know, when I, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't keep a diary. I have I've two, I've a very, very good friend, he lives in Massachusetts, who also, like me, knew Otto, and he wrote down everything. He wrote down everything that Otto said, he wrote down everything that he said. And he's got, you know, these real, th and, and I, I kind of wish I had done it, although I'm not, it's not my style to do that. We, we talked about, um, he was very interested in you know, what I was doing and what my career plans were and what, um, what I, my family. And then of course we talked a lot about, his, you know, about Anne and, um, and then eventually about, about the camps. And we just talked about um, all kinds of things, all kinds of topics. He was very interested, you know, at that time uh, uh, we were talking about civil rights we're talking about, uh, it was interesting, I got a letter from him not long after the um, hostages were taken in, in Tehran, you know, in, in um, I think it was 19, 1979 or 78, I think, the end of 78. And uh, he, we were always, um, he was always very big on current events and what was going on in the world. And of course, he told me about his life, his family, 
but we always seem to, to have uh, things to talk about. And he, he shared, he, he talked to me, um, I think because I didn't go to see him to like, I wasn't going to get advice or to get um, counsel. I just, I wanted uh, to meet him to let him know how much the diary had meant to me. So he, I think he felt, you know, you know, comfortable talking to me about, you know, his life and about some of his thoughts and things like that. And he, uh, we, and then Fritzi, when I would go and visit Fritzi after Otto died, Fritzi always, it was, you know, it was so kind of her. She always planned one event centered around something very Catholic, like we'd go visit a monastery, or we, one time we went to a little, little town way up in the mountains, and they were having on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ in the Catholic Church, they used to, uh, some still do, but they used to have processions where they would take the Eucharist, you know, through the streets and the First Communion kids would get dressed up in their First Communion clothes and the, the um, uh, town elders would come, everybody got all dressed up and they'd have this procession with, the, with either the bishop or the priest. And the little town was just like something out of a movie. I'd never seen anything like that. And she took me there and we went, uh, we always, she always picked some, some place that had to do, you know, with, with um, you know, the, being Catholic, either a church or a monastery, and, um, and we had a great time. She, she was a, a, a very, very good friend and a very, very good, uh, it was nice, because she would talk about her life, too, and, and she, uh, what, what had happened in her life, you know, before and then during the war and then after, you know, after the war. Her daughter eventually wrote a book in, in the 80s, in the, in the, around 1988, sharing her memories and, 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 you know, what had happened to them in hiding and then when they were in Auschwitz and, and, the, and then, of course, after, after the war. But we always found, um, we always found something to talk about. And it, he, he was very, um, he was very um, up on world events. And he, always, he liked to discuss, you know, what was going on in the world and what did I think about this or think about this and, and uh, event or, or happening or, or whatever, whatever was going on. And, um, and he didn't, I actually, I don't think I ever discussed with him about thinking about being a priest. It was, but it was only after he said that to me that I said, oh, you know, that's, that's for me. That's when I knew, that's when the light went on. That's when I knew for me, that was going to be the way I would fulfill that, you know, that wish. So. Well, I want to thank you all for your kind attention today and for coming here. Oh, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't. Any? Yes. Well, in the, um, her last entry was August 1st, 1944, and they were arrested three days later on the 4th. When the diary was published, there's just like a two-paragraph um, uh, epilogue saying, you know, that on August 4th, the, the hiding place was raided by the Gestapo and the Green Police and the families were, you know, the, hi the people in hiding were sent off to concentration camps as well as two of the helpers. And it said that... Um, you know, it just ended, the last sentence was, in, in March 1945, Anne died in the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen two months before the liberation of the Netherlands. He didn't write that. But he, yes, he talked to me at great length about um, uh, his, what had happened to him, you know, after, the, after they were arrested and through the time they were liberated. And then the time, you know, they were four months under the care of the Red Army because they couldn't go home because the war was still being fought. Uh, the Netherlands, the North, Amsterdam was still occupied, and, and of course the war was being fought in Germany, and, and you know, and the Russians were coming from uh, the east, and the Americans, the British, and Canadians were coming from the west. So they were um, former. They went first to Katowice in Poland, and then to um, uh, Chernowitz, which is now in, in Ukraine, and then they ended up in Odessa, which is in the news, you know, quite a bit now, and then. Uh, when the when after VE Day, a ship came from New Zealand to pick up all the survivors to take them back to Western Europe, 
And from there, then they went by train from Marseille back to the Netherlands to a processing center for those returning from the camps. And then, then he went back to Amsterdam. But he didn't, he didn't ever write anything about, well, he, might, I mean, he, wrote, he wrote several letters from Auschwitz and on that journey home to his mother. Th this is really sad, in, who was alive in Switzerland. She didn't receive any of those letters right away. But when he got to Marseille, he sent a telegram to his mother in Switzerland and said, I don't speak, I don't very speak very much French, but, but the way he wrote it, it, it made it sound like he was saying, we have arrived in Marseille, we are on our way back to the Netherlands. And when they received that telegram, this is before he, they had received any of the other letters, they took it meaning we, meaning he, Edith, Anne, and Margaret, that the whole family was together and, and, and then of course he had, when he got back to the Netherlands, he, he had to you know, write and tell them that, no, that nobody came, you know, that they were, they were all, all dead. But they, there was a, there was a, cause they were so, he was him they were so thrilled when they got that telegram because they thought, and when he, when he used we, he was talking about the survi other survivors he was with. That's the we that he meant, but they took it as because, see, he had written all those other letters saying that he knew that Edith was dead. He didn't know where the children were, but they hadn't received any of, they received those letters after the war ended later on. So they, that was the first communication they actually had received from Otto. Yes. Well, that, that was actually before she went into hiding. She wrote those, oh. those paragraphs, yeah. She, she was, it was about three weeks between the time she received the diary, and this is all in the very, the very first few pages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, no, that's... But in a way, it's like, all of a sudden, she couldn't be with those kids, and maybe this was her way of dealing with that. Well, I'll tell you, what she did do in hiding, though, is she did write, um, she carried on a correspondence with one of her dear friends. She, she wrote a letter, of course she knew she couldn't mail it, but she wrote the response that the, the girlfriend might have written and then she wrote back, <laughs> she wrote back to that response. And so she did miss, yes, yeah, she missed terribly. She was a very social person. Yeah. Margaret wasn't so social, but it was very hard for her because she loved being out with her friends and, and doing things and you know, all kind, you know, activities that the, the teenagers like to do but so she actually did write because she was so lonely but she knew she couldn't mail it obviously and and she couldn't obviously tell anybody where she was but those 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 she wrote that was before going into hiding Thank you. you're welcome but I think it shows too that Anne I think sometimes we forget that she was also a very in, in, in a, a very, you know, normal teenage girl, you know, and, and she, but she had a remarkable um, a gift for writing, and she had a very, very deep uh, giving, you know, loving spirit, you know, the, the desire to, to help other people, and that all, and of course, in hiding, she had a lot of time to think about that and to make plans for the future. One of the things, you know, she loved movie stars. She wanted to go to Hollywood. In fact, she even spelled Hollywood with one L, you know, Holywood, <laughs> and uh, which is, uh, is really a contradiction, but um, she, um, she really wanted to go to Hollywood. She wanted to be an author. She wanted to go to Paris and to London, and she had, she had great dreams for the future, but she, she really wanted, she said, I want to make a difference in the world. I don't want to live my life in vain. I want to do, spend my life doing good for other people, even people I've never met. So, um, yes. Why do you think that the many star pictures were saved when they came and took the possession? Um, I think probably because they were pasted on the wall and nobody, nobody thought that they would have had um, any value, I guess. That's, that's actually a good question. They took things like any you know, furniture, um, uh, anything that it would have been in the closets, like any linens, uh, 
uh, I don't know if, I don't even know if they took all of the books, but I know that they took things that, and what they were doing by that time of the war, a lot of those things were being sent in, back to Germany and uh, given to bombed out German families. Uh, you know, the, fur the furniture and things like that. But they, they, the Dutch had a, a, a sarcastic nickname they called pulsing, pulsing a house because the, the, it was a pulse, uh, P-U-L-S was the name of the, the company who, who did all that. And, uh, but I, that's probably why those things, um, is some, something like on the wall, if they had seen what they thought maybe was a, a great work of art or something, I'm sure they would have taken it. But these were pictures like out of magazines and um, uh, things like that, postcards and stuff like that, that she put up um, uh, on the wall. Anybody else? Yes. Oh no, we planned it several months ago, and, and, I, and we were looking for a date. And I said, "Well, how about June twelfth? Because that's it's a weekend, and it's Anne's uh, would be her ninety third birthday." And actually, I had forgotten all about the twenty fifth being the seventy fifth anniversary of the publication of the diary. But we thought it would be uh, nice to have it on on what would have been her birthday. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss? Yes, today would have been her. She'd be 93. She passed away in 2010. She was almost to her 101st birthday. Meep was very stubborn. Her son, Paul, wanted to uh, have her move into like an assisted living place. And she said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay in my apartment. And he was always afraid that she would fall, which unfortunately, that's what happened. She fell and, and broke her neck. So she, but she was almost, that was in January 2010, and in February she would have been 101. So, but we had her for a long time. And even on her 100th birthday, she was very clear, you know, her mind was clear, very lucid, and she had a great time. She loved cutting that cake, you know, that seeing that, that 100 there. And, uh, and of course being, you know, with her son and, and her daughter and her three grandchildren. I, it's the first time that I actually got to meet her grandchildren. So that, that was nice. But, but they're, of course, they're all, all the helpers are gone. And most, most of my Holocaust survivor friends, I was very involved in Holocaust education in, in California, and most, most all those friends are, are gone now. There are a few that are still living. One of Anne's, a good friend of mine, she was one of Anne's childhood friends. She's still alive. She lives in Jerusalem. She's going to be 94 in November, and Eva, uh, Fritzi's daughter, Otto's stepdaughter, just turned 93. She lives in London. So they're, so they're, they're still, um, one of my very dearest friends was one of the Mengele twins. She and her twin sister were 10 years old when they were in Auschwitz and they did those horrible medical experiments on them. And she died in 2019. So mo most, of my, most of my survivor friends are, are gone now. They're not with us now. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes, she was supposed to. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, she's still. It's amazing. I'm. I'm going to be 69 on July 4th, and I couldn't do half the things that she does at at, at 93. <laughs> Yeah, she said, yeah, they had it. Well, we had, yeah, we had a big surge in Europe and here back in, in that the end of the year, beginning of the year. So that got canceled because I was going to go because I was so close. But, uh, oh, oh, well, she's, she's wonderful. She is just, uh, she's, she's a, a dear friend and she's, she's a, a lovely, lovely, like her mother, very good hearted and um, very, um, very kind and, and just a great, a great person. So maybe, maybe she'll be back. I don't know. I know she hasn't been feeling well lately, so I don't know if she'll ever travel like this far again, although I don't, I can't say she won't, but I, I, I don't know. But uh, nice if we get her to come to Pittsburgh. Yeah, so, yeah. Absolute privilege. 
Well, thank, thank you very much for coming today. It was a, an honor to be here and to speak to you.